I think this, I think, should resonate with, with some of you, but not appreciated, frankly, by many advanced country uh, CEOs and boards, is that there has been an incredible growth in the sophistication of purchasing decisions in emerging markets. Increasingly, we see that purchases, whether by individuals, whether by governments in terms of public procurement, whether in terms of companies in terms of industrial machinery, those purchases are made less and less based in terms of what's cheapest off the shelf and more in terms of based upon a life cycle price. And I'll give you one example. I did a book several years ago called Africa Silk Road, China and India's New Economic Frontier, which I think it ha has had some impression on the leadership in Beijing to begin to think about this one belt, one road. But one of the case studies that we looked at in this book is, is small but extremely powerful. And it's the case of blankets being sold in kiosks in South Africa. And this was a case study we spent about a day looking at. And what, what, what occurred about beginning about a decade and a half ago is the Chinese began to sell in kiosks very inexpensive blankets with African designs, and the Africans bought these blankets because they were extraordinarily inexpensive. The problem was that once you wash these blankets, they shrank and the dye ran out. And the African population in South Africa began to refer to these blankets as the wash and cry blankets. What happens? The Indian blanket manufacturers come into the market and they make a higher quality blanket that didn't uh, shrink, the dye didn't run out, and what happened was you saw the Indians take away market share from the Chinese. They were charging a higher price for a higher quality good. At the most basic level, that is going on in terms of these trade-offs of making purchases on a life cycle basis, again, whether it's at the firm level or not. So it's not, you know, economic incentives work and people's purchasing decisions are becoming more and more rational, more sophisticated in emerging markets than I think people understand. Which will not be surprising to, to anyone is obviously there is corruption in emerging markets. Now, I bristle when I say that because I don't want to paint with a broad brush and there is corruption, dare I say, in my own country, in the United States. There's corruption in other advanced countries. What I bristle about is statements that, gee, corruption in Bangladesh is worse than corruption in Turkey. I mean, I've been working in this field on measuring corruption for decades and it's very difficult to tell which is worse. And frankly, it's, it's, it's besides the point. It's there, and the, the, the question is, how can you respond to that? How can you deal with it so that you can differentiate who are the stakeholders and fashion strategies to deal with this problem of corruption? So I, I, I would say that it's really important that when people say, there's a lot of corruption in emerging markets. You got to double click, triple click, and look at advanced countries as well. Perhaps epitomized, let's say, by what the Chinese and the Indians and Brazilians are doing in, in let's say, in, in other Asian markets or African markets, is what they're doing is they recognize, because they themselves are emerging markets, is that there are cross-sectoral deficits in the development of these markets. And so what the Chinese have done extraordinarily well has been to go in arm in arm, different companies across sectors and enter markets that way to fulfill that deficit. The US firms, take one example, this is a very alien concept. Imagine a GE hooking up with a Pfizer and, and hooking up with a, a textile producer and going arm in arm into a very poor country and say, this is a, this is a co-investment that we're going to do. They don't think about it in those ways, but the world has come to the point where advanced countries need to rebundle the way that they package their investment packages. And I would submit that what the, what the Chinese have mastered and they have some way of doing so easier than 
than the U.S. because the state-owned enterprises are still very much dominant and, and mandate the way that these investments are structured, but they have recognized a secret sauce, which is you need to enter these emerging markets cross-sectorally, not just sector by sector. When I look at these countries, when I do deep dives in country after country, is I talk to the finance minister, I talk to the academics, I talk to businesses, I talk to consumer groups, and I get a feel for how these economies are actually functioning. And obviously, no, no, no economy is perfect, right? But I think there is no substitute for on-the-ground intelligence, number one. Number two, what a lot of companies I don't think do well, to be honest, is serious reputation or due diligence of people with whom they want to partner. Mm. And it's not just what, what lawyers do or what investment people like I do in terms of commercial due diligence, but you know, who are the people really behind the people that you want to invest with? And I'll just give you one very, very quick example. I had a client, very well-known client, who I helped bring to Myanmar uh, several years ago to set up a very sophisticated investment. And because of Myanmar's situation, in courtesy of the U.S. WikiLeaks, leaked State Department um, uh, memos, one of the uh, generals, the former generals, was attached to in the cable uh, as being an owner of the number one most attractive plant that my client wanted to buy. And it's a prized asset. 